the magician Houdini had come to Europe. Houdini was um, probably more famous. Well, when, when he first started out as a magician, um, when he first achieved any kind of recognition as a magician, it was in Europe. So he was, lo he was beloved there. He considered England his, his second home. And in January 1920, just as Oliver Lodge is, is, is um, making his case in America, Houdini comes to England. And, and you know, this was about uh, a little over two years after the war. Um, I'm sorry, about a, a, little over, um, a little over a year after the war. And England was still a depleted country. There was still war rationing going on. And you know Houdini is this incredibly potent, vital figure. He, you know, he's the, the very personification of American vitality at the time because you know America was considered a, a young country. It was still referred to as the New World. England was the Old World. England was devastated. You know, America hadn't really been depleted in that way. And so Houdini, you know, shows up with all this energy, and he's send, he's setting box office re, box office records in England. You know, it seems like he can personally just energize and, and it just his, his magnetism and his spirit are just infusing England with this new energy. But what people don't really recognize is that Houdini was depressed. Um, you know, Houdini was a, a really unhappy guy. He, he, um, his mother had died not long before the war in 1912. And um, Houdini... He, had, he was passionately in love with his mother. And uh, E.L. Doctorow once referred to Houdini as the last of the great mother lovers because <laughs> this was, this was bef just before Freud was becoming famous in America. So you could write these love letters to your mother and, and nobody really thought anything of it. Um, so Houdini, she was the, the light of his life. He, he, you know, his wife was second fiddle. And, so she dies and he never recovers from that loss and um, he starts going to see psychics and mediums and to see if he can get in touch with her spirit. But you know Houdini knows all the tricks of, of mediums because when he was young the first time he, he um, made any kind of an impact as an entertainer, the first time he started making any kind of significant money was as a false medium. He had what's called a spook show where he would uh, basically give these false seances and use what he called spiritistic force to make objects fly around the room and raise tables. He would be tied up and musical instruments would begin to play around him. So he knew all the, the secrets of these mediums, but you know, he had this very um, kind of love-hate relationship with them because he, he wanted to find one who was genuine. And so part of his reason for coming to England is because he's, he's begun corresponding with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and he wants to see all these English psychics that Conan Doyle um, ha has been recommending and that Conan Doyle is advocating. So Houdini and Conan Doyle developed this very unusual friendship. Uh, you know, Conan Doyle is this burly, I think he was about six foot three, um, very uh, impressive and formidable figure. You know, the Scotch-Irish knight. Houdini was very potent, but he was very short. And, you know, he was this Jew from the ghetto. And so they form this, this very unlikely friendship. And um, Houdini starts to, to attend seances that, that Doyle arranges for him. And um, then Houdini comes to America, comes back to America. And it seems to some people as though he's bought into this because he starts making a movie um, that, that really is, it, it carries a spiritualistic theme to it. And it seems as though maybe he's bought into it. You know, Houdini was a movie star and filmmaker as well as a magician and an escape artist by this time. So then Conan Doyle comes to America. And what, if, if, if Sir Oliver Lodge sort of planted the seed for this occult revival in America, Conan Doyle, he, you know, he just sets the country on fire. He, he sets um, box office records every place he speaks. Conan Doyle is one of the great public speakers of his time. And, you know, he didn't present things, couch things in a scientific way, the way Lodge did, but he spoke from the heart and he seemed so sincere, sincere. And again, because he's sort of the, you know, he's so emblematic of deductive thinking and, and rationalism because people, some people called him Sherlock Holmes. You know, he had a reputation for being able to, to solve 
these these mysteries himself and and you know clearing the names of criminals who've been wrongfully convicted and this kind of thing and americans had always loved conan doyle anyway so he comes to america and and now you know the, the country is just mad for ghosts and seances and you know it's, it's just becoming this domestic pastime 